So I'll bet the title got you. Baal, Asherah, and the monogamy-only cult. I woke up a couple mornings. It's probably been about two weeks ago now. I woke up with that title running through my head. And I thought, oh, that's going to be a hard one to put together. And yet, all the pieces are there. So we're going to take some time. And, uh, you know, for people that have the attention span of a goldfish, uh, you know, you'll check out pretty quickly. Um, but I, I think over the course of uh, however long this takes, it's going to take some time. This isn't going to be a quick video. Uh, as I'm dropping bombs, the ones that stick around are going to get one bomb after another because we've got lots of cool stuff to go through. A while, a while back, it's been a few weeks ago now, I made a video about, uh, I think it was titled A Warrior's Call, and in it we were talking about Gideon and Gideon's call, and the fact that the angel of the Lord met him uh, and called him to service, and then gave him clear instruction, and one of the first instructions it gave him was to go tear down the altar to Baal and the uh, Asherah pole that was next to it, and to destroy them. And he did. Uh, he took 10 of his servants. They went in the middle of the night. They cut down the pole. They tore down the altar. They, uh, they built a new altar of Yah, I believe, uh, sacrificed um, a, couple, a couple bulls on them, burned up the Asherah pole, uh, etc., and the town was not happy. I think anytime the father is doing something major, uh, particularly when it's re when he is awakening his people, one of the things that is necessary is for the idols of Asherah and Baal to be torn down. Now you may think we don't have those today; those those don't exist. And I'm going to tell you, oh, but they do. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the lineage of those gods. Um, and how they directly influence everything in Western culture. We're going to discuss feminism. We're going to discuss witchcraft, Wiccan, uh, pieces, parts, uh, and the relationship with those as well as the connection, the interconnectedness, and the, the necessity of a monogamy-only cult to support the whole shindig that we inherited through Greco-Roman influence. So we'll talk about all those different parts. Let's start really with, uh, with an understanding of Baal and Asherah. Now, I talked about Gideon just a second ago. Another one should also come to mind, Eliyahu, Elijah. What did he do? You'll recall that when uh, after three and a half years without rain, he challenged uh, um, Ahab to deliver up the, the uh, 400 prophets of, or 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And uh, they all met on Mount Carmel and there was a big showdown. And after Eliyahu proved who the God of heaven and earth is, uh, Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yehovah, a uh, number of different, uh, different names, the yod heh vav -Heh. Um, the eternal and everlasting one. After Eliyahu called down fire from heaven to consume not just the offering on the altar that he had built, but the rocks and it licked up all the water and everything around it, he then commanded that the, that the prophets and prophetesses that were there be captured and killed, essentially destroying Baal and Asherah at that point, or doing everything he could to destroy that at that point in northern Israel. In order for the house of Israel to be restored, one of the things that we must do is identify and destroy the idols, particularly the idols of Baal and Asherah. So let's take a look at these. Baal and Asherah, Baal was the um, the god of, uh, or, or the, the major god of Canaanite worship was called by a number of different names, but particularly Baal, meaning Lord, uh, kind of like, and the Lord said, right? Uh, the same way that Christendom uses Lord instead of using the name of the Most High, 
or referring to the Most High by some other title. They call him Lord. Um, and that was the name of Baal. Baal, actually, Lord or Master, is also the name that uh, a woman would rightly call her husband, her head, her authority, her Lord, uh, as Sarah called Abraham Lord. See First Peter chapter 3, I think it is. Um, so Baal was, was the, the head god of a fairly small Canaanite pantheon, with Asherah being his female consort. She was a goddess of fertility. She was a goddess to whom um, children were sacrificed, just as they were sacrificed to Molech and to Baal. Um, she, was, uh, she was a goddess that, uh, that was, was very wicked and um, sought by any means to overturn the authority structure. Where we really begin to see this, though, is how these gods were then um, imported into uh, the Greek world and ultimately became Zeus and Hera. Now, the, the, the lineage of the gods, if you go back and do your research, you'll find that, uh, that it goes all the way back to Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz, and, uh, and the lineage runs through... Um, through the Canaanite region, runs through Egypt um, and the Canaanite region again into Babylon and into uh, the, the fledgling Greek city-states, where in around the um, 700, 600 uh, BCE time frame, about 600 years, 650 years before the birth of the Messiah, was the time of Numa Pompelius, and he was king of a city-state in uh, in Greece. And during that time frame, it was already uh, common for the worship of Hera, the queen of heaven, who was in um, who was in Greece, and her. Uh, she was the female consort for a male god, Zeus, the, the head of the pantheon. And it was a much larger pantheon than existed in Canaanite times. Um, there's a really good book, and I'm going to bring a, I, I'm going to mention a couple really good books. I will be sure to put links for all of these books down in the, uh, in the comments section here. Um, and certainly, I hope that as we go through this, you'll have you, you'll see things that you want to like, share, or subscribe. So, you know, I got to make all of those things because it's good for the algorithms. If you want this material to keep coming, or if you want it to be shared broader, it's uh, it, it's a real help to us if you will do that. But this book does the Bible condone uh, does the Bible condone polygamy by J. A. Farmer, and actually, it says. Um, the exposing of a slanderous lie that's been laid at the feet of both Jesus Christ and his disciples. And so a significant portion of this is taken from a very Christian perspective, but his research is really good. Okay, so I want to read some quotes and we're going to discuss a few things here as we go. Now, pardon me for putting my eyeballs on when I'm reading quotes here. It says, in the days of Jesus Christ, the queen of heaven was worshipped by the Romans as Juno, the Roman goddess of marriage and women. Under this goddess and her partner Jupiter, and as a matter of worship, the Romans practiced exclusive monogamy, and freedom of divorce was allowed for both the husband and the wife for any reason. For this reason, serial monogamy, the practice of divorcing one marriage mate to take another, was commonly practiced in Roman society. However, concubinage was looked down upon, and polygamy, or polygyny is what he means, was totally unacceptable from page 59. And so he, uh, I, I have not yet drawn the line from Hera and Jupiter, I'm sorry, Hera and uh, Zeus, to Juno and Jupiter. But the, um, the gods that were inherited from Canaanite culture into or imported into Greek culture and then into 
Roman culture are all the same and the same pieces where they're it's kind of refined as we go but one of the major refinements that happened in the time of the Greeks was Numa Pompilius um, outlawing polygyny and making it a law that only monogamous marriages would be um, would be recognized. Now we're going to discuss more about the monogamy only cult a little bit later on, but this is part of it. It builds with all of this. It's part of the whole thing. So <clears throat> some more information from the book, page 61. Hera was the consort of Zeus and queen of heaven. One of Hera's main areas of dominion and worship was that of marriage and women. The Roman counterparts of these two were Juno and Jupiter. Hera in Roman religion was Juno, and again, her primary area of worship was that of marriage and women. Now, remembering that both Greek and Roman societies were monogamous, it makes sense that the legends of Greece speak of Hera's jealousy regarding her husband Zeus's affairs. Uh, lovers and offspring as the requirement or expectation of Hera was toward fidelity within the monogamous marital union between herself and Zeus. Uh, a, a better way to say this, if you go back and study anything at all about Hera and Juno, you'll find out that Hera was a vindictive bitch, is really what she was. Um, she, was the, she was the quintessential um, possessive, jealous woman who was controlling, always seeking to control Zeus and control everything about him and everything around him, uh, even to the point of trying to control his eyes, um, which is not... Um, it, it, it is an inversion of the authority structure. Now, what, what we have to compare this to, and I'm going to come back to this, what we have to compare this to and understand that God's standard from the beginning has always been God, Messiah, man, woman. Okay, And we see that encapsulated primarily in 1 Corinthians 11.3, where it all gets condensed into one verse where Paul says that, uh, that the... Um, that the Head of man is Christ, and man is the head of woman, and God is the head of them all. Um, but establishing very clearly that there is an authority structure. And so in God's authority structure, man's allegiance is to the Messiah, and woman's allegiance should be to the man under whose covering she is, because he functions as her head. He functions as, and this is a much deeper topic that can be discussed at a different point, but he functions as her Messiah, okay? Um, she is to love, she is to um, love and respect. Actually, the, the word means fear, as we see in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32 or 33, fear her husband in the same manner that a man is to fear the Messiah, okay? So it's an extremely high honor, uh, extremely high um, reverence would be a good word. Continuing in what we have here, it says, Hera was also known by and worshipped under the title Queen of Heaven, as was Juno. The Roman goddess Juno was simply the Roman counterpart of the Greek goddess, and thus the two can easily be established as the same goddess from both cultures. And in a minute, he's going to connect um, Hera and uh, and Ashtara, if I remember correctly. But it says, previously noted in chapter 1, the worship of Juno was referred by Numa uh, Pompilius, the second king of Rome, if we then consider the tradi uh, traditional dates of his rule to be 716 to 630, uh, 673 B.C., we can thus understand that the worship of this goddess was already well established by that time. So, the, the, the goddess gets passed down through this, and then we wind up with a, a culture that it understands the goddess and the gods as being personified in the, the government or the human leadership over them is, is how then they put those pieces together. And I've got a quote So I was looking for, I thought I had a quote by, uh, by Brad Scott talking about how the um, Greek gods were personified or pictured by the, by the Greeks and ultimately by the Romans as personified in the 
leadership that they had within their government. So ultimately what happens with the gods is what happens with the, the human leadership in the government. Um, the idea being or the understanding being that how Hera acted and how Hera um, treated Zeus and ultimately what her expectations were in, in her um, marriage in terms of being uh, vindictive and controlling and expecting his fidelity and everything else uh, to the point where she had control over him. Um, he could have control over the gods, but she had to have control over him. Um, was was the major one of the major points that we can draw from uh, Greco-Romanism. Now, with that point made, please consider that the worship of these gods required adherence to the teaching of exclusive monogamy in Roman culture. From page sixty-three of Does God Condone? Polygamy. By the time of Christ, the worship of these gods also allowed freedom of divorce for both the husband and the wife, and both were required to be exclusively married uh, or to be the exclusive marriage partner of the other, and thus for a man to take another wife was deemed unfaithfulness to his existing wife. So it became clear that due to the teachings of these false gods, the practice of serial monogamy became common in both the ancient world as well as in the modern world as we know it. What's fascinating, though, is that in their practice of serial monogamy, they allowed all kinds of other sexual deviancy. It was perfectly all right to have slaves. It was perfectly all right to, um, quite frankly, uh, take young boys, homosexual activity. It was perfectly all right to go to the temples and all the prostitution that that involved, but you were only allowed to have one woman for the purpose of uh, producing a heritable, um, a heritable offspring. And so we, we can see the, the, the pieces being connected here. Let me give you another, uh, another little piece here from... I highly recommend you, you get a copy, find a copy of this, and add this to your library, The Western Case for Monogamy Over Polygamy, John Witt Jr. He's actually making, he works very hard, lots of pages. His, his bibliography alone is 40 pages long. It's crazy. Um, he works very hard at making the case for monogamy only, but he tells you straight up in this book that it's not possible to do that from Scripture alone. He makes his case from Greco-Roman law and Western civilization, okay? And he tells us exactly what the root of um, the monogamy-only culture is and what its purpose was. He tells us on page 104, he says, Already half a millennium before the time of Jesus, Ancient Greece and ancient Rome had chosen monogamy as the only form of marriage that could produce legitimate and heritable widows and children. 6th and 5th century BCE laws of various Greek city-states made clear that valid marriages had to be monogamous. And this norm also became commonplace in the first Roman law collections that had have survived from the mid-5th century BCE. And then he says this, he says monogamy was a quintessentially Greek institution of the ancient world, Stanford ancient historian Walter Scheidel has shown, and the Thracian Greeks and Romans after them regarded polygamy as a barbarian custom or a mark of tyranny. So this is an interesting point that we need to spend a couple seconds on. Western culture derived from Greco-Romanism believes that polygyny is a barbarian custom and it is a um, mark of tyranny. And that is true. That is, that is the way that the, that the Romans viewed the Jews. That is the way that the Romans viewed early Christians who were practicing polygyny. That is the way Western culture has always viewed anybody uh, or any culture that they come in contact with. Um, there's another book on my shelf over here called um, When Polygyny Became a Sin uh, by John Karen Cross. And in that book, um, he specifically states that when the 
I want to say it was the Anabaptist in about the 1600s established a polygynous uh, culture that was working well. They had their own city, essentially a city-state, declared independence from everything around them. And, uh, and the Germans hated them so much that they came in and destroyed everything, killed everyone, man, woman, child, destroyed, utterly erased it, um, precisely because they believe that polygyny is barbaric. They believe that it is a mark of tyranny. They believe themselves to be uh, enlightened of a higher order of people and a kinder, gentler, softer people. So we're going to kill them all. Um, so, yeah. Um, I don't want to go down that rabbit trail too much because we could spend some time there and, uh, and, and I'll, get, uh, I, I'll get wound up. Um, but an interesting article that somebody pointed me to this week that I have not finished reading yet that deals with some comparative studies of American and South African polygyny. And particularly, uh, it's, a, it's an article that, or a paper, really, it's 36 pages long, that deals with the um, emergence of polygyny and their attempt to draw lines between that and the homosexual revolution and some other stuff, attempting to, to paint it in part as a sexual deviance. But they, they demonstrate in the article in a couple of places that they believe that the um, attitude, the Western attitude against polygyny is based on racism. And again, not necessarily skin color, but recognizing or believing that uh, anyone who practices polygyny is practicing a barbarism or, or is, is barbaric. Uh, and part of what they use to illustrate this is how Mormons, as long as they stayed, you know, white and monogamous, um, that was perfectly all right. But once they were white and polygynous, uh, they were practically wiped out by the U.S. government. The, the court system went after them, the military went after them, all kinds of things. Uh, again, and the court system literally labeled them as barbaric, okay? Um, so this is, this is an interesting point, and it's an interesting point of division between the Hebraic culture, the, the, the Torah of our fathers and the Hebraic culture, and what, what Greco-Romanism or Western Romanism would consider itself to be. And it's, it's highly illustrated in the antipathy that, uh, that Western Romanism and Western culture has towards polygyny. But there's a reason why, okay? And so we'll talk about this for a second, and then I'm going to try to get back on track so that we can deal more, more precisely with some of the rest of this with, uh, with Hera and Baal and Asherah and uh, Zeus and Juno and Jupiter. And, you know, just it's, it's the same God and goddess. It's the same God and goddess that have, that, that have come all the way out of Canaanite worship. Uh, the, the, the adversary doesn't have new tricks. He just uses the same one and just keeps kind of, uh, kind of rehashing it and, and reworking it. Um, but the very next page on the book here by John Witt Jr., again, the Western case for uh, uh, monogamy over polygamy. It says, Plato's student Aristotle, 384 to 321 BCE, viewed monogamous marriage as the foundation of the polis. I want you to stick a pin in that because we're going to come back to that. The polis meaning the state, okay? So he understood, Aristotle understood, and he, and he straight up said that, that polygyny afforded the man an opportunity to build his house, to build his wealth, to build a power block, a literally a, a wealth and political base with a large family. It allowed a large family of this sort to have um, enough clout to have sway in a city or in a, in a governmental state. And so governments of a democratic or republic type like Greece, Rome, Western civilization mostly, those types of governments are, are terrified of men being able to build power and build wealth. I would recommend a book called uh, The Polygamous Papers by Hondo Solomon. Good one. That's another one over on my shelf. I, I'm telling you. And I'll tell you something else. A lot of you guys, you like, um, 
You you like Kindle? I've got some things on Kindle, but books like this, if I can get these things in hard copy, I get them in hard copy because when the, the lights go out or if the lights ever go out, I want to make sure that I have evidence so I can point back to and say, look, here it is. It was written down and, you know, I can show it to you in the 1500s with uh, with Ochino. I can show it to you in the 1600s with uh, or 1700s with Madan. I can show it to you in the 1800s with Campbell. I can show it to you in the 1900s with uh, Dr. Luck. I can and uh, and. I could show you in the 2000s with John Witt Jr. and James Wesley Stivers and uh, J.A. Farmer and a whole bunch of other ones. So, you know, e even the stuff that I've written now. The point is, get this stuff in hard copy. Have it so that you can refer back to it. Highlight the, uh, hi highlight the, highlight the crud out of it. All that kind of good stuff. Um, let's see... So even though monogamy was the marital ideal of this classical Western world, both Greek and Roman laws did allow a married man to have sex with his slaves and prostitutes with impunity. These laws also allowed a married man to retain a longstanding concubine so long as he did not live in the she did not live in the marital home and did not inherit anything from the man. One of the things we have to understand is Greco-Roman law is very intentional about allowing promiscuity. In fact, we're going to get to this in a few minutes, Eros Made Sacred by James Wesley Stivers. And one of the things that you're going to find out is that the monogamy-only culture has to have it must allow promiscuity or, you know, even the church, it winks at promiscuity because um, there are not enough marriageable men to go around. And so they have to have some way for marriageable women to be able to have their needs met. And so it winds up being done in prostitution and in uh, promiscuity and side chicks and everything else. We're just going to wink at that so that we can maintain our monogamy-only cult. More on that in a few minutes. So um, just a, a, a quick recap up to this point so that we can run back and, um, and figure this out just a little bit. A quick recap up to this point. Asherah and Baal, fertility goddess and the, the head god, and she is is the the singular consort of his for the purpose of maintaining parity and for the purpose of um, ultimately we see the adversary's intent over and over is to invert the authority structure to take the man and make him subject to the woman we see that uh, in in feminism in spades today we'll talk about that in a few minutes but primarily what we see is we see that that Hera, as the goddess of marriage and uh, the goddess of women, was setting an example of control and vindictive behavior and, um, and trying to manipulate and manage Zeus such that her, her husband was her subject. She was the queen of heaven. She was the one that he that he would bow to, not unlike today when a man gets on one knee and asks a woman to marry him and to be his one and only forever. That's exactly what she wants. She wants his submission, right? And uh, and, and that continues on and on into um, into the marriage, and it's an inversion of the authority that God gave man over his house, over his woman. Okay. So let's see if we can uh, let, let's see if we can continue here, um, so we get on into some more of this really good stuff. We need to talk for just a second about the the Roman promiscuity that was going on. Okay, said so Greeks and Romans were strictly monogamous in relation to the marital union, but divorce was allowed. Uh, uh, but divorce, so as to allow a change in the wife a man had at any given time. By the first century, this consideration was also applied to the wife to allow the same variant in marriage for her. Thus, serial monogamy was commonplace. Okay? The fact is, the marital union was not treated as a permanent union by many, and thus the marital union was often a place of treachery 
in relation to the conduct of a husband with his wife. She could not count on the marital union as being permanent. Indeed, under the rules of the of the marital of Roman marital union, the union could be severed by either the husband or the wife. And this was one of the uh, one of the points of discussion that was going on in Matthew chapter 19. The the rabbis, uh, particularly the house of Hillel, if I remember correctly, really kind of wanted only one wife, but you could divorce for any reason. They were following a fairly Greek line of thinking that probably had somewhat been inherited earlier when the Greeks were in charge of um, in charge of Jerusalem and had control over over uh, Israel before the time of the Maccabees. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> the house of Shammai was much more strict on what a woman could be divorced for. Uh, however, Yeshua, Jesus, makes the statement, he says, you know, a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh. Uh, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. The point that he's making is, is that marriage union is not to be dealt with treacherously. That is now an indissoluble union, apart from some very specific things that are enumerated in Scripture, uh, adultery being one of the majors, Right. The point that he's making is, is when those come together, you can't simply toss her out and go trade her in for a different model just because you don't like uh, how she handled your toast this morning or something. Okay. Um, it continues, the practice of prostitution, sexual acts in worship, adultery, selling one's wife, divorce, and serial monogamy were all acceptable in the Greco-Roman Empire. Okay. So we see Paul talking against all of those things as he upholds the, um, the dignity of marriage. But as you see, as you will find in the, a paper that I wrote that's on academia.edu titled Paul's Perspective on Polygyny, um, he very specifically leaves the door open in every passage that he talks about marriage. In every passage that he talks about marriage, he leaves the door open for polygyny. Uh, and Christendom twists or misuses those verses in an attempt to uphold their cult. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So um, absolutely recommend both of those books. And I want to get into um, the sixth chapter of James Wesley Stiver's Eros Made Sacred. Now this chapter right here is an amazing, amazing chapter. Feminism, witchcraft, and monogamy. And he makes a very strong case. In fact, this whole chapter, I've about highlighted the whole thing. If you, if you see some of this stuff, I've got, I've got highlights on every page. It's a, this is an amazing, uh, an amazing chapter with just all kinds of great, uh, all kinds of great stuff. It's hard to hold this up here for you. But I'm telling you, just over and over, and every time I go through, I find new stuff. Um, so I, I started highlighting or underlining with a red pen. Um, just lots of bombs dropped in this chapter. The price of the book, just that chapter to have in hard copy for you is worth it. But he starts off, he says, feminism, monogamy, and witchcraft form an unholy trinity working the destruction of Christian civilization. Now again, this author comes from a Christian perspective for some of the things, and so we kind of have to recognize he doesn't see things every, everything the way we do. But in this area, he's absolutely got some serious, serious truth. Uh, according to romantic feminism, which lies at the foundation of the women's liberation movement, Romantic feminism believes in the ethical and spiritual superiority of women over men. The notion of feminine superiority was necessary to justify women's suffrage and the notion of liberation because of the tyranny, quote, tyranny of men. Okay. So the average feminist believes in the functional equality of the sexes. Okay. They believe anything you can do, I can do and probably better, right? And so the the assumption is that men and women are equal. And so therefore, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other, it doesn't matter, right? We can get rid of all the men and we'll be just fine uh, is ultimately the way it gets played out. But what, what happens is if there's an authority structure, God, Messiah, man, woman, if they can then make this come into parity, right? 
uh, particularly through a monogamy-only cult where it's a one-to-one ratio, now the woman's in a position to begin to gain control or authority over in that individual marriage and uh, corporately on a broader scale. Feminists believe they are more developed emotionally than men and thus are better equipped to reduce conflict. The male's territorial ambitions, pride, and sexual aggression leads to war, which they consider the ultimate evil. So they consider the things that God gave you as a man, the ability to to have dominion, the ability to take charge, they consider the 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 aggressive side where men are competitive and the men, and and men will guard and protect their flock uh, guard and protect their territory they'll stake out or they'll they'll head off into the wilderness and you know carve out a piece right um, they consider that to be a, uh, a a a lower state of being right the fact that you know now that the frontiers conquered they no longer need us right uh, that sort of thing so um, that becomes kind of the foundation for the thought process of feminism. And you go back to Hera and you go back to Zeus and her attempt to, same thing with Asherah and Baal, attempt to have control over, have authority over, um, over them. So he continues here. It says, over the last several years, we see this theme receiving serious attention. Books like When God Was a Woman by Merlin Stone was on the cutting edge of feminism's war with Christianity. One book review begins the de- description of that saying, here, archaeology documented is the fascinating story of the religion of the goddess, known by many names, Astarte, Isis, Ishtar, among others, she and the matriarchy, reigned supreme in the Near and Middle East. And then they continue and draw that line straight into Hera and Juno, right? Um, In addition to being worshipped for fertility, the goddess was revered as the wise creator and the one source of universal order. Again, place the goddess on the pedestal and, and, uh, and... the head god was to bow down to her as with all others. So this is where things start to get really interesting, and this is where we start to understand the monogamy-only cult. So I'm going to start start bringing some, some fresh bombshells here for you. So continuing with witchcraft, uh, it's not difficult to show the ideological affinity between it and feminism. Stiver says, Witchcraft is not Satanism and the worship of the Christian devil. Rather, witchcraft or Wicca is the old paganism of goddess worship, a natural religion centered on the mystery, sexuality, and psychic abilities of the female. A modern witchcraft blended with science is much more sophisticated than ancient medieval witchcraft. However, ultimately what we have today in the... um, in the West is a blend between feminism or, or a synthesis between feminism and witchcraft. One of the interesting things that you will have is that always, always, wherever you have um, witches, you have abortions. Also, wherever you have monogamy, you have uh, abortions. And monogamy only always calls for abortions. And here's why. Ultimately, what happens is, is in a monogamy-only society, because more women than men exist, always, at every time, it's always this way, because more women than men exist, um, then it leads to prostitution, which leads to the need for um, abortion, but also women, in an effort to continue to be attractive to their husbands when there are plenty of others out there, uh, often will resort to abortion as a way to not go through all of the hormonal changes of having a baby, um, which end up with mom bod versus having, you know, the the um, much younger looking, uh, assumed attractive body of uh, of a woman that has never born a child. So abortions are connected with monogamy and abortions are connected with witchcraft, okay? How are abortions uh, connected with witchcraft? 
one of the things that always, always happens, particularly in a um, with the existence of witches, it's necessary to have. Uh, it, it always involves sexual um, promiscuity, and uh, that tied in with the worship, and that always leads to temple prostitution, which is an integral aspect of ancient goddess worship. Well, then what do you do with uh, the children? If they're not aborted, the children are raised and turned into, um, into human sacrifice or flipped over into the sex trade of uh, the temple system. Okay, so this is the old Baal religion denounced in the Bible. Ash, uh, in the Bible, Ashtra with Baal, her male consort, were the generic names for each local pantheon of deities. Baalism occurred in the advanced pagan cultures of Rome, uh, uh, of Egypt, Canaan, Babylon, Greece, Rome, etc. So listen to this. Uh, again, this article that. This chapter is so full of just nuggets, okay? The monogamy of ancient times was created in order to ensure a static order and equalitarian society. So Western civilization um, succumbed to or embraced monogamy only as their way of operating for multiple reasons. We see in John Witt's book, he talks about it because it's good for the polis. Essentially what it does is it prevents a man from competing with the police for, uh, uh, polis meaning city-state, okay? Um, or, or like metropolis, metropolis. Uh, competing with the polis for, um, for market share instead in a monogamy only society because he could not build a power block he could not build a wealth block he could not build a large family instead he was dependent upon the the state uh, for his provision so in a monogamy only society it makes the man and his family dependent on uh, the um, the city state but what it also does is it shifts the balance of power from man being the head of his home into, it shifts the balance of power into a, 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 a parity because no longer is the man unique in his home by virtue of the fact that there's one of him and there may be one or two or three or four women. Instead, now there's parity and so from there comes, uh, comes some of the problems. So monogamy could only be sustained by public prostitution. Okay, He goes on and makes the case for that and explains that wherever there has been prostitution, witchcraft has flourished. Um, because if for no other reason than for the fact that prostitutes have turned to witchcraft to prevent or terminate pregnancies. goes back to the piece connected to, um, to abortions that we were talking about. Monogamous wives fear losing their husbands if they do not maintain their youthful beauty and vigor, which pregnancies rarely... Uh, exempt as a price. Children also take a toll on the affluence of a family, the time a woman can spend with her husband, and the general success with housework. Hence, contraception, aberrant sex, and abortion go hand in hand with polygamy, or with monogamy, where polygyny greatly lessens these stresses and consequences. So, Stivers is dropping bombs here, okay? Again, understand, so Baal and Asherah are the are, are the gods, god and goddess that are uh, of fertility and the establish this parity in relationship. And then we see that they uh, are inherited or imported into Greece as Hera and Zeus, and then imported into uh, Roman uh, Roman culture as Juno and Jupiter. And in the process, they, the fertility goddess is morphed into a monogamy-only, vindictive witch of a woman that controls her husband and, um, and destroys any other woman that dare come near. Okay, I, I know that doesn't sound like any of the women today or anything. Um, just saying, right? Typical monogamy-only culture. Right. Um, so, 
Stivers continues. He's got lots and lots of good stuff here. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this just because there's there's no way to get into all of all of the things that he gives us. But we've got another good page or two where he says, A shortage of men interested in marriage requires the monogamous woman to compete with the prostitute for the affections of the male. The fact is that... I've demonstrated this on other videos. There, you know, you can go back and check census reports at any time that censuses have been taken. And apart from intentionally killing baby girls, like you had in in China in the in the one child uh, one child policy that China had, that's been such a such a massive failure. Um, except in a culture like that where they value baby boys and so they're killing baby girls, except in that culture, women always, always, always outnumber men. And the older we get, the greater that disparity becomes because women live longer than men. Um, men do harder jobs. Men do dumber things. Um, homosexuality. Men go to prison at a much higher rate than women. Um boys do dumb things you know it, it just it's the way it is and so marriageable women always 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 outnumber marriageable men and so therefore they have to compete for in a in a monogamy only culture compete for a man and then have to figure out how to control him and keep him from uh, having any of those god-given desires where he would want to just basic nature want to take care of or protect uh, other women around him okay um, so the the shortage of, of uh, marriageable men then by definition leads to women who are going to find a way to have their needs met and find a way to provide for themselves witness Africa where um, Western Christianity went into Africa preaching monogamy only and broke up families, told men that if they didn't divorce all, all but one of their wives and send them away, they couldn't be saved. Of course, you know, you're preaching hellfire and brimstone and terror and all kinds of crazy uh, instead of the Torah and what the Word actually says. That's, you know, a different plug there. But the bottom line is, is that the destruction of the continent of Africa can be laid at the feet of Western Christianity teaching a false monogamy only, uh, teaching a doctrine from Scripture. And ultimately, as I've said, it's a cult. Now let me address that for just a second. I'm gonna, we'll, we'll come back to some more pieces of that. But I want to tell you the monogamy only, um, the, the monogamy only mindset is a cult. Uh, it, it is cult-like in its behavior. Um, many of my listeners, I would love to have some of you put your stories in the, in the chat down here um, or the comments section, but I can tell you many of my listeners have had the same experience that I had. Uh, you read the Bible, you see the truth, you recognize what Scripture actually says about marriage, and then dare to open your mouth about it and people will try to kill you. That's the end of relationships. It's the end of family. It's the end of friendships. You know, for me, I prayed a prayer a long time ago. I told God, I said, I just want truth. Show me truth. I don't care what the price is. I'll pay any price. Just show me truth. Well, the price ended up being my job as a pastor, uh, the denomination that I was in, uh, much of my side of the family, um, all of my friends at that time, and that was just the Torah portion. It was a little bit later on when we when we understood marriage and and what Scripture says, and we lost a whole other bunch of friends that were in the Torah world because they were more in love with the cultish doctrine of monogamy only than they were with the Word of God and the truth. Now the state, um, the the government. Uh, and don't fool yourself. Most uh, most pastors are very much in bed with the government one way or another. Or at the very least so in love with their paycheck and their job that they're not willing to pursue what truth really is because they're afraid of losing their job or losing their family. Um, I, I've had men straight up tell me, you know, that it, it would cost them their, uh, <clears throat> it would cost them their wife if they were to speak the truth on this matter. Um so it's a, it, it's a cult. It really is. It's a cult. And cult-like behavior follows those who seek to defend 
monogamy only because you can show them what scripture says and they want nothing to do with it and um and they will try to destroy you for taking a a a strong and righteous stand for the truth okay continuing here the notion that, that civilizing the male occurs by submitting his sexuality to the maternal sexual patterns of the female is skewed okay it's warped um and uh, so restraining a man's virility is perverse. He is a man, not an angel. If he cannot lawfully have polygyny, then he will seek a whore, which is unfortunate, but that's the truth. And the bottom line is that God created some men. Go look at David. Go look at Jacob. Go look at Abraham. Go look at Gideon. Go look at God created some men with the ability to take care of more than and to provide for more than one woman. Uh, and the heart to be able to do it and to try to restrain such men who have the financial means to be able to do it is itself sin. It's actually a doctrine of demons. Go see it. It says forbidding, uh, forbidding marriage. That's a doctrine of demons. And that's what the church does all the time. The church also all the time looks at single women and says, no, we'll pray for you. Okay. They just pat them on the head. We'll pray for you and see if God will bring somebody for you when they may or may not know the truth, but the bottom line is Scripture says that, that she has options, and her options include married men if she chooses to walk in submission to that man and come under his authority and his headship and be part of his house. Okay. There has never been a monogamous society in the history of mankind which has not been forced to wink at unchastity. In a polygynous society, there is no excuse for it, and it can rightly be punished severely. Monogamous societies must be lenient towards the harlot, and so doing it creates a cultural force in favor of witchcraft. How about that? Monogamy fuels witchcraft. Monogamy, or monogamy only, okay? And let me, uh, let me make another comment here, okay? I had a friend call me the other day, and he said, Pete, you really need to remember to make sure people understand that you're not telling men that everybody has to have more than one wife. And I'm not. I am not. What I am saying is, is that God does not say anything about monogamy or polygyny. What he says is marriage. God talks about marriage. And he says it's good when a man finds a wife. So I assume it's good when a man finds another wife or another wife. But if a man only finds one wife, that's a good thing. Let him love her. Let him take care of her. Let him be a godly man to her. And there's nothing wrong with that. If he chooses to only have one wife, that's his choice. That's not her choice. Okay. In fact, uh, another piece for you is if you want to find out whether or not you're the head of your house, go home and say, honey, I've been reading up on polygyny. And she says, polygyny? What's that? And you say, well, the, the Bible says a man can have more than one wife. That's the, that's the instant you're going to find out who the head of the house is. Right there. Because World War III is probably about to happen. There are a whole lot of men that think they're in charge of their house. But if they bring this topic up, they will very quickly find out they are not in charge. Because she is going to reach over and go, they're mine. Right? <laughs> I'm telling you, a bunch of you guys think you're men. You're not men. You just, have, you, you just think you are. Uh, feminism demands equality, and where, it, uh, and where does it learn the notion of equality but from monogamy? In monogamy, there is an equalitarian demand for a numerical equality of the sexes. One woman equals one man in marriage. Here's what you find that's very interesting in witchcraft. In witchcraft, always they've got to have parity between the yin, yin and the yang. Uh, or between the, 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 uh, the opposites, the poles, or however, always, always there's going to be parity in the number of men and the number of women. Okay? Um, social mores may uh, separate the notions of economic or functional equality. Uh, uh, let me see. Equality from equality in being, ontological or essence, for a while. That is, men and women may be considered the same in the sense of human of being human, but with different roles. The antebellum tradition has succeeded in this separation to a fault. However, heroically, 
defended, these secondary defenses are challenged and broken. Society adopts a compassionate view of marriage. Women begin to view their husbands as chums, parody, chums, and not lords. And then the distinction of the roles become blurred. The confusion of roles never occurs in a polygynous household. For the numerical inequality of the sexes makes the man special and the natural order or natural source for leadership and arbitration. Thus, his priestly and governmental headship is enhanced. Now listen. A woman without a man as her head, either father or husband, is in a state of anarchy. It is as evil for a woman to lack that headship as it is for a man to lack the headship of Christ or for Christ to lack the headship of God. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Scripture does not teach in vain that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. 1 Samuel 15, 23. The revolt against male authority or its evasion is the central pillar of feminism and witchcraft. Monogamy wars against that authority by creating a growing class of women who are unattached to families. Here's the thing. Feminism, monogamy, and witchcraft are all connected. They're all part of what is the monogamy-only cult. It is necessary for them to exist for monogamy only to be the, the cornerstone. And for that to happen, all that is is that's an act of making the woman the goddess, right? She's in charge, the goddess of marriage and monogamy, right? Because that's what Hera was, the goddess of, mar uh, of, of uh, marriage and monogamy. And it goes right back to Asherah. And so the... the the, one of the major linchpins that we have, a major linchpin that we have in, in tearing down the adversary's system, in destroying the adversary's system that involves those things, witchcraft and feminism and monogamy only, major um, linchpin is to pull on that one that says, no, man is the head, and man, if he chooses, can have more than one woman. Period. End of story. And right there, that linchpin pulls out and you begin to see all the other pieces crumble. That's the point at which it breaks the yoke of feminism and it breaks the yoke of, um, of control that a woman has in a relationship is when a man makes that declarative statement. Now, that's not the end of the war. That's just the beginning of it for most men. Because at that point, now what you've got to do is you've got to learn to be the man that God has called you to be and to lead. Be the spiritual leader, not just a big bully in the house. Be the spiritual leader and to walk and act and love and lead as the Messiah does. But you have the authority. I don't recommend that you go do it without absolutely seeking the Father first and, and getting, uh, getting yourself, getting your house in order. But it's important, it's absolutely imperative that each of us come to a place of acceptance, fully accepting, not just ourselves, but our women, fully accepting that it is righteous and it is completely justified by God and it is to poke a finger in the eye of the adversary simply to accept that polygyny is righteous. That's a kick in the teeth. It's a kick in the groin for the monogamy-only cult when you tell them that, right? And it's to demonstrate that Asherah and Baal have no control, have no authority. You are not under the thumb of the um, fertility goddess and her, con her male consort, Baal. Rather, it's to step out and say, huh, I choose Yah. I choose Yah's ways. I choose the authority that he's given me as head in my home. I choose the authority that he's given me as head over my woman or my women or my family, etc. Okay? But then you have the responsibility of walking in that authority. You have the responsibility of learning what that means. Okay? There is so, so much more here. Um, Enforced monogamy is not a biblical teaching, but a doctrine at the heart of Wiccan religion. 
witchcraft teaches the doctrine of equal polarities. From the Baal and Ashtaroth religions of the ancient Middle East to the Greek and Roman pantheons of gods and goddesses, the universe is comprised of an ultimate dualism working its way down to a number of particular dualisms. Okay? The Chinese have known it as yin and yang. Among the Zoroastrians, it was light and dark. The ancient philosophers talked of universals and particulars, or cosmos, uh, cosmos and chaos. Okay? He continues, talking about the same stuff that I was talking about just a, just a few minutes ago. Okay? But <clears throat> the bottom line is this. The bottom line is this. The opposite of pagan... Roman, Greco-Roman monogamy only mindset is to accept the Torah and what it says about what a man uh, can and cannot do, what, how the Torah defines marriage, and, uh, and then recognizing the authority that you have there. Doesn't mean run out and try practicing something that you're not prepared for. Most of us, having been raised in this culture, do not realize how much stuff we've got to unlearn how many things we've got to take care of, right? Um, but I'm telling you, this is, this is a big place to start, and it's understanding that there is a strong connection between Baal, Asherah, and monogamy only as a teaching, okay? That is the adversary's, that is the adversary's piece, and within the monogamy only uh, piece, as we've talked about, is witchcraft, feminism, and... Um, and monogamy as as part of that witchcraft and feminism always come with that uh that was the downfall ultimately of the roman empire um exactly those pieces and feminism was was a major piece of it so all right guys a whole boatload i dumped on you this evening a lot of different parts to think about um Again, some great books, uh, Eros Made Sacred by uh, James Wesley Stivers. Strongly recommend that. Um, same thing with J.A. Farmer's uh, does, uh, does the Bible Condone Polygamy and um, John Witt Jr.'s The Western Case for Monogamy Over Polygamy. Okay, for King and Kingdom, I bid you shalom.